Hello, my name is Charlie Till. I'm one of the education team with the Scottish Ambulance Service. We're going to look at the cranial nerves and how to assess them. It's very important to remember that we can't fully assess the cranial nerves in the out-of-hospital environment. We can only do an overall gross assessment looking for larger, more obvious problems. And if we've still got any concerns, it's important we refer the patient on to further care. When we run through the cranial nerve assessment, some cranial nerves involve uh, assessment in groups and others involve assessment individually, so we'll try and make sure it's clear which ones you're assessing as we go through. To start with, I'm going to ask the patient about the first cranial nerve, which is the olfactory nerve, and it controls your sense of smell. The only way we can really assess that is to ask the patient if there's been any changes in their perception of smell recently. So I'm going to ask that in two ways. First of all, I'm going to ask, you've not noticed any uh, inability to smell recently where maybe you've had a nice dinner in front of you but you've not been able to smell it as you'd expect? No. And also, you've not had any smells that didn't uh, sort of fit in with your environment, so you've not been smelling toast or burning or anything when there wasn't that smell no. around you. Okay, that's fine. Next, we're going to assess the optic nerve. That's cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve. We're going to do two tests. First of all, we're going to check for visual acuity. That involves normally a Schnellen eye chart, which we don't have available to us. So we simply need to check if the patient's ability to read things has changed. So I'm going to find a newspaper or maybe some lettering in the back of the ambulance, whatever is written there, and ask the patient to read it out loud to me. If they normally use contact lenses or glasses, I'm going to make sure that that's appropriate. So if you can just read what it says above that door over there. Exit. Exit. Thank you very much. Would you normally be able to leave a, read a sign in that direction? Yes. Yes, that's fine. The other thing I'm going to check is the patient's visual fields. This is not checking the muscular movement of the eye. We're coming to that shortly. This is checking the peripheral vision and what the, the eye is receiving when it's not focused on an object. So to do this, I need the patient, I need you to stay very still for me, because we're going to lock eyes, and I'm checking what's appearing in your peripheries. So throughout this, you need to make sure that you maintain eye contact with the patient, and if they start looking from side to side or up or down, you need to start again. What I'm going to get you to do is mirror my movements. So I'm going to get you to put your hand over your eye, and I'm doing the same, and I'm making sure that I'm mirrored with the patient. I'm then going to use my hand to create movements in different areas of his visual fields. So we're going to lock eyes, and I just want you to tell me when you see my finger wiggling, okay? No. 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 Keep eyes on me? No. No. Okay. And what I've done there is made sure that I could see what he was telling me he could see. And we're assuming that if we're both on the same page, that I'm not finding any problems there. One problem we may find is that there's a particular patch of vision that the patient is actually unaware of and that they're not aware that they can't see that area. So it's only on doing this check we find that they can't actually see a finger in one of those visual fields. And we're going to do the same for the other, other eye. So I'm going to get you to mirror me again. And we're going to lock eyes this time, and it's the same again with the wiggling finger, okay? No. 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 Okay. When I'm also doing this with the patient, I'm making, no, it's fine. I'm making sure that my hand with the wiggling finger is an equal distance between the two of us, and it's not too close to the patient or too close to me, because that could give an inaccurate finding. We're now going to assess cranial nerve 2, the optic nerve, and cranial nerve 3, the oculomotor nerve, together through the patient's pupil reaction, and also we're looking for accommodation and convergence. The reason we're checking these together is because the optic nerve is responsible for what the pupils are receiving information-wise, they're sensory, and the oculomotor nerve is responsible for moving the pupils and the control of the eyes. So what we're checking now is that the eye can receive information and also that it can react to that by moving the eye. So first of all, we're going to check the patient's pupils. I'm making sure I'm using a proper assessment pen torch, not a pen that's also a torch with a very bright light in it because we don't want to hurt the patient's eyes by using an LED. We want a nice yellow, weak light that's not going to cause any discomfort for the patient. 
What I'm going to do now is just put my hand here so I'm separating both eyes so the light does not come across. I'm going to shine it first into one eye and I'm looking at that first eye to make sure the pupil constricts as we'd expect. I'm going to shine it a second time into that first eye but this time I'm looking at the patient's other eye and this is checking for a consensual light reflex. When one eye receives light, both eyes should constrict. If they don't, that's a problem. So that's why I'm shining light in one eye twice, and each time I'm looking at the other eye or the first eye to make sure they have both constricted, and I'm doing the same with the other eye. So again, I'm just gonna put my hand here. I'm shining a light in the eye, it constricts. I'm now looking at the other eye, shining light in the first eye, and seeing the other pupil constrict as well. What I'm also checking for is accommodation and convergence. So this is where the pupils should move together as something comes towards the face. So to do that, I'm just going to get you to, again, to keep your head still and just look at the end of my torch. I'm going to bring it closer to your face, okay? Just keep your eyes locked on it. And as expected there, the patient's eyes are starting to cross over as I get closer to the face. What we may see is something called nystagmus, which is where as the pupils come together and their vision crosses, they start to jerk in that movement, and that is a concern. I'm now going to assess three cranial nerves together. Cranial nerve three, the oculomotor nerve. Cranial nerve four, the trochlear nerve. And cranial nerve six, the abducens nerve. For this, I'm checking the patient's eye movements to make sure they can move their pupils into all four fields of the eye because those three nerves control the muscles that move the eye. So this time it is okay for you to move your eyes but I want you to keep your head still. Mm -hmm. If the patient struggles to keep their head still, place one finger on the tip of their chin just to remind them to keep it still. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is with your head still, I want you to look at the end of my torch, I want you to follow it. Okay, so you are allowed to move your eyes this time. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna keep your head still and just follow the end of my torch and I'm drawing a big H shape. So I'm going up and down into all four of the fields. And I've checked that the patient's eyes can move in all four of those directions. If you're making this quite a tight, quick assessment, you can actually check for convergence at the end of this by doing your H once you've done your big H check. And then at the end, you, that's when you move it in to check for convergence to save doing that twice. I'm now going to assess cranial nerve number five, the trigeminal nerve, which is responsible for taking sensation from the different areas on the face. Trigeminal gives you a clue, tri meaning three. It has three branches that come across the face. We can remember them by placing three fingers like this and seeing that one goes on the forehead, one goes along the cheek, and one goes along the jaw. I'm going to check sensation in all three of them at once, and I'm going to check both sides. So for this, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and I'm going to gently cause a different feeling on a different part of your face and I want you to tell me where I'm touching on your face, okay? So if I can just get you to close your eyes, where am I touching? Forehead. And did it feel the same on both sides? Yes. Okay. Eyes closed. Where was that? Cheekbone. Same on both sides? Yes. And one more time, eyes closed. Where was that? Jaw. The jaw on it. Same, same on both sides? Yes. Fantastic. You can open your eyes again. Thank you. Now I'm just going to place my hand underneath your jaw. Keeping your head still, I want you to push my hand away by opening your jaw. So opening your mouth, pushing my hand down. Fantastic. You can close it again now. So I'm checking that he's got good strength opening his jaw there against resistance. I'm now going to assess cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve. There's several things I'm looking for here. First of all, I'm assessing the patient's face for any symmetry. Specifically, I'm looking for any asymmetry where potentially nerves have become paralyzed or relaxed and there could be a facial droop. Hopefully, if this was very evident, we'd have picked it up on our FAST test before going into a cranial nerve assessment. I'm also going to check the strength of the patient's eyelids. There are two ways to do this that different books will teach you. I'm going to tell you why we're doing one of them and not the other. The first one, which we're not doing, is where you're going to move your hand towards the patient's face and get them to close their eyes against resistance, but this puts you at risk of poking the patient in, your, in their eye because you're moving your fingers very close to an open eye. What we are going to do is assess the strength of the eyelids opening. So to do that, we're gonna get the patient to close their eyes, 
and I'm just going to touch your eyelids, okay, so don't get a fright. And now my fingers are moving towards a closed eye, so if I do slip, I'm not poking the patient in the eye. And what I'm going to do is I'm just putting my fingers on your eyelids and just open them for me. So I'm just creating some slight resistance on the eyelids and making sure there's strength enough to open and that's equal on both sides. I'm also going to check for symmetry of the mouth. So can I just get you to grin for me? Fantastic. And like with a fast test, I'm making sure that that's equal and there's no facial droop. And the last thing I'm going to check is their cheeks. So I want you to just puff out your cheeks for me like a hamster and hold that in. And I'm going to press and they should be able to hold that in against resistance. If they start to have some air slipping out when you press, that's another subtle sign of a weakness around the mouth. Another thing I could ask here, though it's difficult to assess in the out-of-hospital environment, is if they've had any change to their perception of taste. So if they've been adding more salt or sugar or sauce to the food that they've been eating, or if food's been seeming more bland recently. We move on to cranial nerve number eight, the vestibulocochlear nerve, which innovates the ear. We can initially assess hearing now, and then at the end of the assessment, we'll assess the balance aspect of this nerve so that we're not getting the patient to stand up and sit down throughout the assessment. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a very quiet sound near each of your ears. And I want you to tell me which ear that sound's coming from. And to do that, I'm going to get you to close your eyes, okay? So I'm going to make a very quiet sound simply by rubbing my thumb and forefinger together and held near the ear. That's a loud enough sound that they should be able to detect. Which ear is that? Left. Okay. Which right. ear? Left. Both. There we go. What you'll find when you're doing the third one and you're assessing both is that either you've started one just before the other or the patient will particularly find one ear slightly louder and then they'll realise you're actually doing it in both ears. So make sure you do that assessment slightly longer than the sound on the other two. When you're doing this, you need to make sure the patient has got their normal hearing aids in and you need to ask about what their hearing is like normally to make sure any findings are new and not things that we know about already from the patient's history. We're now going to assess three cranial nerves at the same time. Cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal, number 10, the vagus nerve, and number 12, the hypoglossal. These innovate the mouth and the throat. First of all, we're going to ask the patient if they've had any difficulty swallowing their food as it may have been developing over some time, they may have had more chance of choking or, or, or problem swallowing and needing to chew more. So whilst you've been eating, you've not noticed that you've been gagging on your food or having any sort of coughing episodes that are new to you? No. no that's fantastic. I'm also going to check their ability to swallow now. But just lift your chin up slightly so I can see your neck and just swallow for me if possible. Fantastic. I'm just making sure I can see good movement of the neck. If the patient struggles, if they've got a dry mouth, we can just get them a sip of water and ask them to take a sip of water. I'm also going to get my pen torch and have a look at the back of their throat. So if I can just get you to say, ah, and stick your tongue out for me. Ah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. What I'm looking for here is the uvula, the little thing that hangs down at the back of the throat that you can see when someone says, ah. I'm making sure that that's hanging straight down. If it's pulled to one side, then it is deviated. And what that means is that the muscles that are pulling on the other side that keep it in the middle have stopped working very well. So the muscles that are still working can pull it over to their side. And that is another sign that we need to have investigated. Don't confuse this with just a slightly angled uvula. It will be fully pulled over to the side. If the tip or if it's just slightly bent in one direction, that's not a problem. The other thing I'm going to check is the patient's movement of their tongue. So I'm just going to get you to stick your tongue out in front and side to side, left and right for me. And I'm making sure that the tongue can move in both directions. We're now going to check our final cranial nerve, cranial nerve 11, the spinal accessory nerve, which innovates the movement of the head and neck. To do this, I'm going to get the patient to move their head against resistance from side to side and to shrug their shoulders. So what that means is I'm going to put my hand here and I want you to push my hand away by turning your head. Fantastic. And the same in the other direction. Fantastic. Now try and keep your shoulders down and shrug them up to push me away. Good. And now keep them up and don't let me push them down. Fantastic. And that's just making sure that the nerves control the muscles appropriately in the head and neck. Once I've assessed all of the cranial nerves as best I can with the patient sitting down, I'm going to come back to the vestibulocochlear nerve and do a standing balance check. 
I'm going to do something called Romberg's test. This involves the patient just standing with your feet close together for me and your hands just hanging by your side. And with your head up, I just want you to close your eyes and keep them closed. Now, as the patient stands there, if they start to wobble and rotate, that's suggesting that there's some form of balance problem with the vestibular cochlear nerve. You can open your eyes again now. We need to do that for at least 30 seconds because as the patient cannot see for longer and longer periods of time, their points of reference in the room and their points of reference to balance become more and more historic, meaning only the vestibular cochlear nerve can keep the patient upright. If there's a problem with that nerve, the patient will start to rotate and the longer they stand there with their eyes closed, the more obvious the rotation will be. You need to make sure that you're standing there ready to catch the patient if they become truly unbalanced. With the patient standing in a normal position with their feet shoulder width apart, their eyes open, if they're st struggling to stand in this position, if they're off balance, if they're having to move to stay on balance, that is suggestive of, of cerebellar ataxia, which is obviously a red flag. The final standing check I'm going to do is to look for pronator drift, assuming I've not already done that as part of my FAST test. I'm just going to get you to bring your arms up in front of you, that's fantastic, and close your eyes and keep your hands up. What I'm looking for is any dropping down whilst their eyes are closed, which they wouldn't be aware of, any weakness in that arm. I'm just going to keep your eyes closed, turn your hands upwards, and the same, keep them there, and again I'm looking to make sure that there's no drop over a few seconds. Thank you very much. You can put your arms down and open your eyes. That concludes the cranial nerve assessment. What I'm now going to do is do a peripheral nervous assessment, which would together make a full nervous system examination. It's unlikely that you'll come into a situation where you need to do one of these assessments in isolation, and they should both be done together to give you a full clinical picture of the patient. It's important to remember that we will not be doing a cranial nerve assessment on any time critical patients and on any patients that are presenting with obvious neurological problems. So if they are fast positive, we've already found a problem and we do not need to delay with further assessment that patient needs to be transported to hospital quickly.